In March 1976, while I was praying at home, I had a visit from the Lord Jesus Christ. I had been praying in the Spirit for days when all at once I felt the very presence of God. His power and His glory filled the house. A brilliant light illuminated the room where I was praying, and a sweet and wonderful feeling came over me. Lights flowed in billows, rolling and folding into one another, and rolling and out of each other. It was a spectacular sight. And then the voice of the Lord began to speak to me. He said, I am the Lord Jesus Christ, your Lord, and I wish to give you a revelation to prepare the saints for my return and to turn many to righteousness. The powers of darkness are real, and my judgments are true. My child, I will take you into hell by my spirit, and I will show you many things which I want the world to know. I will appear to you many times. I will take your spirit out of your body and will actually take you into hell. I want you to write a book and tell of the visions and of all the things I reveal to you. You and I will walk through hell together. Make a record of these things which were and are and are to come. My words are true, faithful, and trustworthy. I am that I am, and there is none beside me. What I just read was an excerpt from a book called A Divine Revelation of Hell, written by Mary Baxter. And in her book, she shares her account of Jesus taking her to hell for 40 days. And in this book, she tells of seeing hell in the shape of a human body and traveling to different parts of it. The legs, the belly, the jaws of hell, and other parts. She tells of accounts in seeing demons tormenting people and individuals and the sins they committed and having personal interaction with them and with Jesus along the way as if he was a tour guide. Mary Baxter is not alone in her supernatural claim. Many others have claimed to take trips to hell as well. You never expected to be there. I've also been to hell. I've seen people who went to hell. Someone who totally, absolutely despised and hated God would never come back to him. I did see Hitler, and I tell people all the time, I saw Hitler the first time I was taken there, and he was hanging on a meat hook in hell. And I want to say this. You can be as wicked and evil as you want to, thinking Satan will reward you. He rewards no one. He hates everyone. And those who serve Satan the most will be the most tortured in hell when they get there. There's no reward in hell. It's so worth it to give yourself to Jesus Christ. To hell and to heaven. Uh, There was one place in hell you talk about that kind of really explains hell. It's called the chamber of despair. Yeah. Describe that to me. Yeah. Uh, This was a place that um, people who are tormented by demons in their minds are are sent to. Uh, These demons already were tormenting these people on the earth, uh, causing them, even some people, to commit suicide. And rather than turn to Jesus for help, they didn't. They denied Jesus, got mad at Jesus, and the enemy was able to bring them there. He, um, it, these people were tortured daily. And while I was going to get to this place, walking down this uh, tunnel, this avenue with Jesus, I could hear this loud clanging noise. And what it sounded like, it sounded like somebody with a sledgehammer banging on chains. Bang, 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 like that, all, all the time, constantly. And so I was wondering, what is this noise? So finally, we get to this chamber, and I see this big clock hanging over the top of the chamber. And this clock represented to the people that they were going to be there forever. And the demons would chant to the clock. Every time the clock would uh, chime, they would chant, forever, forever, you will be here. Forever, you will be unloved, 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 forever unloved. Never, never will you ever feel loved. Never, never will you leave here. Things like that. Over and over and over, constantly. When one demon got tired of saying it, another one would pick up the chant. Continually, these people were tortured like that. And so Jesus and I stood there and watched this, and Jesus talked to me about it, explained to me what was going on, and then he backed away from this chamber. And as he backed away, the people that were in there recognized that Jesus was there because there's no light in hell. It's all darkness. The only light that was there was coming off of Jesus. And so when they recognized that there was this light that was being drawn away from them, they knew Jesus was there, and they started yelling out to him screaming to him to help them. He said, I can't help you now. His, you can, and so I'm standing right beside Jesus, and, and he's got his arm around me, I'm close, and I could feel his broken heart for these people. I could see what they saw, I could hear what, it's a different dimension, I can't describe it. I could, I could feel what they could feel, I could hear what they were hearing, I could see what, what they were going through, as well as what the demons were doing to them. And that was an amazing thing. Give you a couple of examples. People ask me, well, what's hell like? What's these cells like? They're like waking up in a non-ending living nightmare. It -hmm. never ends. And it's a recompense. That's all I got to say. And so 
people in these cubes uh, were not being tormented or tortured by God. That's another myth. It's, it's what they've done in life allows that to happen to them. Mm -hmm. And so that's important to know. I'm glad you important. said that, Brian. This is not of God. This is apart from God. This is like yeah. the, the yeah. trash bin of, uh, of existence here. Yeah. The the devil, yeah. In Matthew chapter 25, hell was originally designed for the devil and his minions or his fallen angels and the de demons and stuff. But, um, but people who want to follow that, the God of this world, the devil, you know, you're part of his minions. It's, you need Jesus Christ. You need to avoid this place. And because nothing, there's no, there's no amount of being reformed in hell at all. In other words, what was happening was that people were becoming worse. Because I look inside there, they were becoming worse. What are we to make of these accounts? Have these people truly gone to hell? And why don't we have accounts in scripture of living people taking trips to hell? We are going to discuss this topic of hell today and see what scripture has to say on the matter. Hi there, and welcome to the Love Sick Scribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the word and loving the one who is the word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Sick Scribe. It has been said that Jesus spoke of hell more than any other person in the Bible. In fact, Jesus spoke more about hell than he did heaven. And there are several verses that we can go to in the Bible to see what he said about Hades and hell. When looking at a few of the claims that we've already listened to in small pieces, and as we look at some of these others, one thing that we can most certainly agree upon with those who claim these experiences is that hell is a real place. Now, there are questions that arise when talking about terms such as Hades, Sheol, hell, Gehenna, the lake of fire. And if people who claim such experiences are true and even necessary, we can also evaluate if the gospel of Jesus Christ is truly being shared or if the claimed experience of going to hell is elevated along with the person that's speaking while leaving Jesus as a mere tour guide. With that being said, let's take a look at someone that we've talked about before. Now, I'm going to use a particular individual who we have covered in a previous podcast about trips to heaven. And this is Kat Kerr, for those who may be wondering who this is. She has done interviews talking about and even going to churches and talking about her trips to heaven, her many trips to heaven that she's taken, and as well as her trips to hell. So let's see what she had to say about what hell is like. Oh, the next question is about hell. Um, somebody wanted to know, are the gates of hell literal gates on the earth and is hell in the center of the earth? Well, let me tell you, first of all, anything that's um, associated with hell or a part of hell is a spiritual realm. It is not a physical realm. In other words, you wouldn't see it with your physical eyes. God would have to open your spiritual eyes to see that. There are literal gates that enter into hell. They're spiritual ones. Um, and actually, you know, the word says that Christ has the keys to hell, death, and the grave. He himself sometimes walks through hell even now. Um, and people, of course, still want to be rescued out of hell, which is impossible once you're sent there and you live there. There are literal gates. There are spiritual gates. It talks about them in the Word. And when you, once you pass through them down into hell to live, you are there forever until later when the judgment comes. Hell itself, yes, is actually in the center of the earth. It also is a spiritual realm where when you die, if the enemy owns you, he takes you there. Um, like the Father told me, when you die, whoever owns you will come for you. Make sure you belong to God the Father and don't give your life and yourself away to the enemy. If you ever live in hell, you'll never get out. The torment will never stop. It's a spiritual realm. But when you die, out of this physical body steps a spiritual body that looks just like you. You experience everything around you in heaven. It's joy and pleasure and delightment and love and hell. It's fear, uh, never-ending fear, almost to the point of being insane. You feel all the torment on that spiritual body as if it was your physical body. So it is a literal place, but it's a spiritual place. As I said before, we're going to come back here in a little bit and talk about the different terms that are mentioned in Scripture, because I think that there is some confusion about the difference between Hades, Sheol, Gehenna, Hell, Lake of Fire, those different terms. And we're going to talk about the differences in those and refer to some good resources that I found that I found a couple that actually echoed the same descriptions in there. So we're going to look at those to kind of give us some more that that will provide some help to us in our understanding biblically as to these places and to try to dispel some of the confusion because what she's saying yes it is a spiritual place but at the same time 
uh, Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, to not be fearful of the of man who can kill your body, but to be fearful of the one who can cast body and soul into hell. And so that dispels the whole thing of, well, the body's just useless and, and your body doesn't matter. Um, but your body does matter because when you're, you're you are going to have a resurrection. Now, the, your body that you have now is not going to be the same body that's glorified, but you are going to have a physical body. You're not just going to be spirit. So it's not just spiritual. And we can see that as we go on, uh, even in Revelation about the, the talk of the, the lake of fire. But the, I won't get ahead of myself. Let's keep going with this. So we're going to listen to another clip from Kat Kerr in her interview with Steve Schultz, which she's on the Elijah list quite often and, and shares different things. But in this interview that she had with Steve Schultz, um, it was split up, it looks like, into different sections. And this one section, this one video you can find, it says, can we pray people out of hell? She had this to say about that particular topic. This person says, can we pray people out of hell if they're already there? And my ad addition to it is, what about the people who died, suddenly slipped into hell or were on their way, however you would describe it, and someone comes along and, and, and raises them from the dead? Technically, you just prayed that person out of hell. How would you answer that question? Can you pray someone out of hell? Well, I do know that what you just said does happen, that even when people have just recently died and people give testimony themselves that this happened to them, uh, people who have died and were entering into hell and all of a sudden they were snatched back out of it. That was because somebody was praying for them. That's exactly what happened. So in that way, in that way, and I think it talks somewhere in the Bible about rescuing souls. Isn't that interesting how it's mainly focused on prayer, which I'm not diminishing prayer. Prayer is something that we are allowed to do by God. We have that privilege as believers to approach the throne of grace that we can pray. We are encouraged to pray in the New Testament as believers, Old Testament believers prayed as well. However, the focus is in or emphasis is on what you do. Um, not on the sovereignty of God and on his mercy and on his grace, on his timing. You notice how the emphasis is going to be put on what you do. Just, just wanted to point that out. Um, and if that happens immediately, of course, that could happen. And many people are even resuscitated, uh, died on the operating table. They were in hell. They actually died and they know they flatlined. And that person actually was in hell when they resuscitated him. It brought him right back out of hell. So in that way, that can happen. But you, nobody can go and pray if somebody died three months ago and they're actually in hell all that time. Right. That's that's too long. That's gone too far. It's <laughs> hell, death, and the grave, and those are three different time time periods from the time somebody loses consciousness and dies until they are buried. And so they're buried, and that could be days, that could be weeks sometimes, depending. But Christ has keys, which people almost never think about. And it depends on if somebody's standing for their salvation, have been believing and praying for the salvation like a family member, and they died, and they were like dead three days, gone down in hell for three days. Christ could pull them up, say why he did that, and ask them, do you want to receive me now? What? <laughs> When I had, when I listened to this clip, I was trying to figure out what does she mean pull them up, and it's almost as if she doesn't really clarify that, but it almost sounds as if she's saying that he pulls them up in the spirit, and talks to them. There is nowhere in Scripture where that is said at all. It is it Scripture makes it clear that it is appointed for man to die once, and then comes judgment. That's in Hebrews. So we know that Scripture is God's word. We know that it is the truth and we have to go by it versus personal experience, someone else's opinion about anything, their feelings, whatever it is. Those things do not take precedence over scripture. So what she's saying here, there's lots of things. I mean, there's lots of things that Kat Kerr has said. If you listen to her, um, her content. There are a lot of things that she says that are highly questionable, extremely concerning, extremely concerning, that do not testify of the true gospel. They're not pointing back to Christ, and they're pointing to these experiential things. They're pointing to things that aren't biblical. I've heard her say things that completely contradict the gospel, as I've shared in the past. 
But it almost sounds, this does sound like that she's talking about in a spiritual sense that if a person is praying for a loved one, then, then Jesus can raise them up. It's almost like that we're giving Jesus permission to do that through our prayers. Again, do you see the emphasis on your abilities or or other person's abilities in prayer and that God has to honor those things? God doesn't have to do anything. We are the created beings. He's the creator. And so I, I just thought that was really um, weird to be honest with you, when I heard her say that. But let's see what else she has to say on this, and then we'll move on to the next clip. That, well, right, that, was, that was my other variation on a theme. Let's say they don't get, they don't come back to life. They die, uh, and they're going to hell. And two things could both happen. You could say, Lord, I wanted him to be saved, please. And at the same time, the Lord's saying, I'm giving you an opportunity before you have your other choice. Do you want me or not? Do you want me or not? That was another thing that kind of hit me too. It's just really strange that wording, do you want me? That's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. God is not interested if we want him or not. The whole point, the whole point of the gospel is that we are in need of a savior. We need Christ. And we'll get to, again, I feel like I'm going to jump ahead of myself today on this episode because of some of the things that are said. But I, I, I want to make a, a, a case here at the end that I think that something is glaringly missing from these accounts when you hear them. And so we'll get into that. But yeah, uh, Jesus asked, can you imagine the, the second person of the Trinity, the, the God of this, the Almighty, can you imagine Almighty God, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, saying to someone who's already passed, who's died, who um, has not been born again and has not received him as Lord and Savior, saying to him, oh, don't you want me? Are you sure you don't want me? I'm going to give you one last chance after you die again. Where is this in scripture? These these are things to consider and think about. And yes. they say, Yes, I want you with Zoop. They go. Yes. They may not they you may never know. Until you right? get to heaven one day. <laughs> yeah. So I mean if somebody if there's someone I loved and they flatline and the doctor says, I'm sorry, they're gone, that's the moment in time to pray <laughs> at least to me, that's how I would use that information. If I you're would say, pre- present if you're present when it happens especially okay you actually could command their spirit to come back into their body uh no you can't you can't do that we do not have the authority to do that and that is acting like god we don't have that authority you all and the fact that people were able to raise the dead in scripture when we see the apostles and see the old testament prophets they were able to do this It was because ordained by God himself to do such a thing. For you to say you have that ability in and of yourself to raise the dead. And again, this is coming from someone who I have not talked about this on on any episodes, but maybe uh, I'm I like to tell on myself sometimes even though it's not pleasant maybe I'll talk sometime about my veterinary um, experiences that I had and the things that I would do uh, when I was on the job and some of the things that happened that but I was one of those people you can ask people that knew me really well in that movement I was one of those that I believed in raising the dead and doing those things including with animals so Again, I am not immune to this type of belief or teaching or anything. This gets way out of balance when we start claiming this own authority for ourselves and we're not understanding biblically what this means and also even understanding biblically what the what the power of the resurrection of Christ is and that we're not promised that we're going to raise from the dead after sickness here. And yes, God does miracles. He does supernatural things. Because he's sovereign in that. And we don't need to have an explanation for it, even though as human beings, we want explanations for everything. But he does things in his own way and his own time. There are people that have near-death experiences or that they die and that they are brought back. And that's because of who God is and that he is being merciful and gracious. That person, maybe they are not saved and that they are given an opportunity, but they need to hear the gospel. That's the point. It's not about an experience. It's about the gospel. And so I told you, this is going to, this is going to be just, just bear with me on this. This is going to be an interesting one today. That's actually the proper thing to say. 
Like if yeah. I'm in the hospital room and I know they died and they flatlined, I've, I've been in, the, in that place before. You could say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command your spirit to come back into your body. And they would go zip back into their body. That happens a lot, actually. Now, the, on the other side of all that, it also depends on who has been praying for that person. And Jesus already knows those prayers have been accounted for. And it Okay, so sorry for the interruptions on that and sorry for the rabbit trails. Uh, the last clip we're going to go to, when asked if Christians can go to hell, uh, this was an interesting comment that she had again with Steve Schultz, uh, what Kat Kerr had to say when people claim that Christians can go to hell. I found it not only interesting, but ironic, and I think you'll see why. Either they didn't mean what they said, they were just joking in their lives, or it was the situation where somebody was taken to the mock hell mm. and they are shown people in this mock hell is a place Satan created. He can make things in the spirit realm. And when a spirit comes to ask you to go with them, you better test that spirit. And Satan does that often. So there's a mock hell that has uh, not real. This whole thing's made up, but it looks real. You can see children in there. You'll see believers in there and they're being told this. And there are people that were told this. They're, those believers are in hell because they were wearing, wearing makeup. Those believers are in hell because they're wearing blue jeans. It was the most outlandish thing. They were told this lie. That that's they why were they told were... that the people were taken to this place. Fake hell, yeah. A fake hell. And they, they still travel and speak about the fake hell. And they said they saw children in hell because they disobeyed their parents. That's a big red flag for me right there. Yeah. And so the issue with this fake hell, because people don't understand the spirit realm. It's a real place. It's a literal place. There is building materials, spiritual building materials to build things. I see when I go out, I see places all over the place, some built by hell. You don't see them with your physical eyes. Uh, and so he has made in the second heaven a mock hell. And it's fake and it's not real. So he can convince people because you know what? They had a real encounter. The bottom line we're looking for was, did this person really have that encounter? Most likely they did. They traveled, they were taken to this place, probably by some something that looked like an angel, and they were told this information, and then they're always told, go back and share the truth. Well, that's not the truth. That's a lie. Yes, they had an encounter. That was not an angel of God. That was not the real hell. Trust me, there's no children in hell. No believers go to hell. Those who break the law of Christ, those who abandon Christ, and it says your name can be blotted out. If it's blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life, you're not a Christian, <laughs> okay? You're unrighteous, unrighteous, and you've gotten so your mind so seared with evil and wickedness, you don't care if you ever were again. That name will be blotted out, and you would go to hell. And so I don't want people to think we're all going to go to hell. I didn't say that. I said a true believer of Jesus Christ wouldn't be in hell. And you're not right. going to go to hell for wearing jewelry, makeup, or blue jeans, people. You go to hell for rejecting outwardly, openly rejecting, hating, and despising Jesus Christ. Now, I do agree that true born-again Christians do not go to hell. Having said that, I would like to ask the question, how does she know that what she's seen is not, that it's not true, that it's deception? Which, where do we see a mock hell mentioned in Scripture? So this is something that has been made up, but how does she know that what she's seeing is not deception? How does she know that she's not being led astray by a, a demonic entity that's showing her these things and leading her in a strong delusion. I think that's a fair question. So there are many clips that could be played. Uh, there are many people, if you look this up online, if you look up books, there are people that have written books about trips to hell. There are people that have had many interviews and gone to churches and ministered and talked about their trips to hell. There are accounts of seeing famous people in hell which is interesting because you will hear people claim that they've seen uh, famous people in heaven. I've seen Michael Jackson, and I'm probably going to get bashed for that. It doesn't hurt me or bother me because I saw him, and he yeah. was worshiping Jesus Christ. And whether you know it or not, anyone out there, I can tell you, he was pursuing Christ in those last days. He was going to do his final tour. Now, I didn't follow him or anything like that. This is just things that Jesus showed me. He was, he was, he was preparing for his final tour.
while there are others online who claim they've had a vision of the same celebrity in hell. Um, Michael Jackson, he was right next to him, like on his right side, and he had on his red outfit, I guess, that he used to wear when he was still living, and he was coughing as well, he couldn't breathe. There are people who see Satan and demons, they're tormenting people in hell, concluding that the demons and Satan enjoy doing this. Why do the demons keep uh, penetrating people with pain and suffering? Why, why do they keep it up? See, they enjoy it. That, that's what makes them happy. They enjoy doing that kind of stuff too. They do it because especially... They're like sadists. Exactly. But especially if you were a Christian at one time, oh, then they really thrive on that because that's something that now they can tease you for all eternity. Listen, that demon was laughing at me, making fun of me, and it was doing the same thing to all these other people. All these demons were because I bought it. I bought the lie. And all of a sudden, you heard a voice. Yes. That was Ivan Tuttle on Sid Roth's show. He was talking about his experience and his trip to hell. Then he talks about, especially if you were a Christian, that sets up the uh, belief that you can lose your salvation, that some people believe. There are some people that believe in eternal security, that once you are born again, that you, you know, the scripture talks about that we're sealed by the promise of the Holy Spirit, that he is the down payment for our inheritance. The, the, and the scriptures that point us to the fact that um, that Jesus cannot be, that we cannot be snatched out of Jesus's hand or the Father's hand that He and the Father are one. That's in John six or that's in John uh, ten. So there's different passages that people look at uh, when they're talking about eternal security versus uh, the, on the other side of the fence the people that believe well you can lose your salvation. So that's what he's talking about there. I found that to be an interesting statement. So here's a question to consider. When you just listen to a little bit of these clips, and I know that we're not hearing the full thing in context, um, but what I wanted to really capture today was the fact that we do see people that talk about these trips to hell. Um, they, there are lots of people out there, they, they talk about this and they write books about it and um, they're profiting off of it from these experiences that they're having and um, elevating this experience and really talking about demons and Satan and hell and things, which I, I'm not disputing that hell should be talked about. However, here's something to consider. Why are these accounts necessary? Because if they're necessary, then that may lead someone to think, well, you know, Scripture is not really sufficient in telling about hell, in the importance of what hell is and, and why it's there and why we need to be aware of it. And the fact that Jesus actually described hell sufficiently to us when, when, and to those that were listening to him in his earthly ministry. He also spoke of Hades. And we also know in Revelation that it speaks of the lake of fire and it is the place of eternal torment. This is not a place where people are going to be annihilated, that they're not going to exist ever again once it, they're in there, that they're just completely destroyed. Just like heaven is an eternal place, hell is an eternal place. This is, um, we know in Revelation when it talks about that the beast and the false prophet will be thrown into the lake of fire. Satan will be as well. But the beast and the pro false prophet, the beast and the false prophet are the first inhabitants of hell, of the lake of fire. We then go on to see that Satan will be thrown and cast into the lake of fire, which, by the way, helps us to see that actually hell is not Satan's playground. It's not where, you know, we've seen these cartoons. I don't know if it, how old you are, but I grew up watching Tom and Jerry, and you would see the cartoons of, um, of the devil that looked like a dog that was trying to put him in the boiling pot of water, and he had to have Jerry sign the little piece of paper within an hour in order for him to go up to the pearly gates in heaven and to enter heaven, uh, which we know that's not biblical. But we can see from just from that example, we've all thought of this. And so when we hear people talk, about this, one can make the case that maybe culture and society or those thoughts have have shaped people when they've seen these things and they believe that they're real accounts, but they could be being deceived or it's their own imagination when they're talking about their, their trips to hell, um, or maybe they've read Dante's Inferno and talk about the different levels of hell. I had to read Dante's Inferno when I was an undergrad. When you see these things or hear about these accounts, that's a lot of people will say that. They'll talk about how Satan enjoys tormenting people and the demons torment people and that they're beating people up and tearing them to pieces. 
But hell, hell was made for Satan and, and the demons. Scripture tells us this. But we also know that that's where people go that um, they when they face the great white throne judgment in Revelation 21, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. And this is eternal torment. It never ends. And this is the payment for sin. This is just payment for sin. So having said that, I know that there may be some questions. What's the difference between Hades and Gehenna, the lake of fire, Sheol, these different terms? Maybe you're confused about them. I too was confused on them at one point. And when I started looking at some of these, it started making some sense. The first article I want to share with you is from the Blue Letter Bible. If you haven't looked at Blue Letter Bible, you can get an app on your phone for that. And you can get the online Bible in different translations. You can even get it in an audio form. It's really helpful. But you can also find on their website on Blue Letter Bible, they have um, lots of good resources that you can look at and find some different things if you're doing a, a, a topical study on something from the Bible. So I actually found this article from Don Stewart. It's called, What is Gehenna? So I'm going to read some of this to you. Uh, Don Stewart says, another Greek word that is translated hell is Gehenna. This word is used 12 times in the New Testament with Jesus employing it 11 times. Gehenna is derived from the Hebrew Gehenom or the Valley of Hinnom. Hinnom was probably the name of a person in ancient Israel. The Valley of Hinnom is a deep, narrow glen just outside of Jerusalem. It was also called Tophet or the Valley of Dead Bones. And he references Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 40 there. He also talks about briefly the history of this place. It was used as a child, a place of child sacrifices. We see this in Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 31 where it says, And they have built the high places of Tophet which is the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my heart. We see that they offered their their child sacrifice, they all offered their children as human sacrifices to Melech here. We see that King Ahaz was an evil king. Second Chronicles chapter 28 verse 3 says this about him, and he made offerings in the valley of the son of Hinnom and made his sons pass through fire according to the abominable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. We also see the abominations were stopped by King Josiah. In 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 10, that he defiled this place and that he made it to where no man could make his son or daughter pass through the fire to Melech. Now, as we go on, you may hear when you're reading through scripture that um, actually Jesus refers to a place Greek word is used in the New Testament called Gehenna. And those that lived in Jerusalem, they would have recognized this word. So this was actually a place of burning refuse, which is where the Valley of Hinnom is, or Tophet. So the, um, Don Stewart says, the valley became the dumping ground for the sewage and refuse of the city. It was a place of crawling worms and maggots. By defiling this place with refuse, Josiah stopped the child sacrifices. Fires burned continually to destroy the garbage and impurities. Hence the name Gehenna came to be used as a symbol of punishment. The prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 66, 24, and they shall go forth and look upon the corpses of the ones who have transgressed against me for their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. They shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. And we know that Jesus spoke of the unquenchable fire. He referenced that in uh, the gospel of Mark and Matthew. We know that he, he talked about this where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. So we see that Jesus uses the symbolism of Gehenna to describe the place of everlasting punishment. So when he spoke of this, the people would have recognized what he was talking about. In Mark chapter 9, verse 43, Jesus said, It is better for you to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go to Gehenna into the fire that shall never be quenched. And in Luke chapter 12, verse 80, he said, Fear him who after he is killed has power to cast into Gehenna, which he also talked about that in Matthew 10, 28, as I said earlier that he said to fear the one who can cast both body and soul into hell. And Jesus spoke in Matthew 23, 15 um, concerning Gehenna, not only to warn people, but to condemn the hypocritical religious leaders. He said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win pr one proselyte. And when he is one to make him twice as much a son of Gehenna as you yourselves. 
Um, the symbolism of Gehenna, Don Stewart says, is also found in its location. Gehenna is a place outside the city of Jerusalem. The ultimate fate of the wicked is suffering outside the gates of the New Jerusalem. And it's compared to Hades. Now, we know that Gehenna is not Hades, as we're going to see in another article here in just a minute. Hades is a temporary place of the dead where only their souls exist. So I looked at several different sources for this, and they agreed with this. And it made sense when I read it this way. So you may not agree with me, but from what I can understand and see, it looks like Hades and hell are not the same place. So that kind of helps us understand that. In the Old Testament, we see the reference to Sheol. Now, when we look at Luke 16, which we'll look at in just a minute, we do see that Jesus is talking about this. This is not a parable. He doesn't say it's a parable. It sounds like an actual account that took place, a, a, a real a, account of Lazarus and the rich man. And we see that there is a chasm in Sheol. On one side, it's called Abraham's bosom. This is where Lazarus went to when he died. And the rich man went to the other part of Sheol, which is Hades. And he talks about how it's it's hot there and he just wants a drop of water on his tongue to 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 quench the thirst because it's so hot and he wants someone to go to his family members and um, we see what what is said to him there. We can take a look at that in just a minute. But just so you're understanding, Ge Gehenna is not Hades. So that also presents a problem too for some of these people that are claiming that they're going to hell because Nobody, if, if you hold to the belief that Gehenna is hell, then nobody is in hell right now. Those that are awaiting their eternal judgment for the second death are in Hades. And so that's a distinction that needs to be made there if we're trying to understand scripture. Um, in Gehenna, wicked dead exist in both body and soul. Again, Matthew 10, 28, I'll bring that up again. The suffering in Gehenna is eternal while the suffering in Hades is temporal because it's almost as if it's a holding place. Now, there are two articles I looked up on gotquestions.org. I've mentioned this website before. This is a good site to go to. Another resource that you may find helpful as far as finding information if you're doing a, a topical Bible study on your own time. So it talked about what is Gehenna, and I wanted to add a little bit more to this, as we've already mentioned. Uh, the Gehenna Valley was thus a place of burning sewage, burning flesh, and garbage. It also talked about that um, Gehenna represented a, such a vivid image that Christ used it as a symbolic depiction of hell, as we've already mentioned, a place of eternal torment and constant uncleanness, where the fire never ceased burning and the worms never stopped crawling. And... This is also, too, where um, the dead bodies of um, criminals, is, from what I read, would also be put there. The corpses of criminals, dead animals, um, and all manner of trash were to be destroyed there. There's another article on gutquestions.org. It says, what is the difference between Sheol, Hades, Hell, the Lake of Fire, Paradise, and Abraham? So I wanted to read these to you to give a little bit more understanding. So the word paradise is used as a synonym for heaven. We see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, and Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. When Jesus was dying on the cross and one of the thieves being crucified with him asked him for mercy, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Luke chapter 23 verse 43. Jesus knew that his death was imminent and that he would soon be in heaven with his father. Therefore, Jesus used paradise as a synonym for heaven, and the word has come to be associated with any place of ideal loveliness and delight. Take note as well, there is no mention in scripture when Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. There is no mention in there whatsoever that Jesus went to hell and was and suffered for three days and three nights in hell and that he had to be born again and that what he did on the cross was not sufficient. This is a teaching that comes from the word of faith. This is something that Kenneth Copeland and other people have taught. Kenneth Hagin taught that, that Jesus had to be born again in hell and that he suffered and was, was tormented by demons. There is nothing in scripture to support that. And this scripture alone would refute that type of teaching. Abraham's bosom is referred to only once in the Bible in the story of Lazarus and the rich man. So I want to turn there for just a, a few minutes and look at Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19. It says, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. 
And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. That's scripture, by the way. And this was, that's the Old Testament. And he said, no, father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Now listen to this. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, i.e. the word of God. Neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Isn't that interesting? I'll just leave that right there. That gives you a little bit of food for thought. Abraham's bosom was used in the Talmud as a synonym for heaven. The image in the story is of Lazarus. I'm reading from gotquestions.org again. Reclining at table, leaning on Abraham's breast at the heavenly banquet. The point of this story is that the wicked men will see the righteous in a happy state while they themselves are in torment and that a great gulf has, that can never be spanned exists between them. And uh, Abraham's bosom is uh, stated to be a place of peace, rest, and joy. In other words, paradise. And we do see in the Hebrew scriptures, the word used to describe the realm of the dead is called Sheol. It simply means the place of the dead or the place of departed souls or spirits. The New Testament Greek equivalent to Sheol is Hades, which is also a general reference to the place of the dead. And then it goes on to talk about the Greek word of Gehenna, which we've already talked about. And, um, other scriptures in the New Testament indicate that Sheol or Hades is a temporary place where souls are kept as they await the final resurrection. The souls of the righteous at death go directly into the presence of God, the part of Sheol called heaven, paradise, or Abraham's bosom. And so we see some references to this in Luke chapter 23, verse 43, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, Philippians chapter 1, verse 23. Um, the lake of fire mentioned only in Revelation 19, 20 and 20, 10, uh, 14 through 15 is the final hell, the place of eternal punishment for all unrepentant rebels, both angelic and human. And we see this reference in Matthew 25, 41. It is described as a place of burning sulfur and those in it experience eternal unspeakable agony of an unrelenting nature. This is referenced in Luke 16, 24 and Mark 9, 45 through 46. Those who have rejected Christ and are in the temporary abode of the dead in Hades or Sheol have the lake of fire as their final destination. I would tend to be one that agrees that Gehenna is synonymous with hell, with the lake of fire. Those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life should have no fear of this terrible fate. By faith in Christ and his blood shed on the cross for our sins, we are destined to live eternally in the presence of God. Now, Having covered those areas, I wanted to play a couple of clips I came across when looking for teachings on hell, when I just typed in and wanting to find some sound biblical teaching on hell and to get a little bit of information for you, I found two clips. The first one is from R.C. Sproul, and I think you will find this both sobering and insightful. Do you ever wonder what people are doing who are in hell? Jesus doesn't describe everything activity that takes place there. But he does describe two responses of humans who have been consigned there, where he says, in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Some people, when they wake up in hell, will be devastated. And they won't find enough water in their eyes to satisfy their need to weep. They'll be sobbing. Oh no, not here. Oh God, please have mercy upon me be the greatest disappointment they could possibly experience to wake up in hell. But then the other group will be there, won't be weeping a bit. They'll be gnashing their teeth, which is a biblical metaphor for human 
fury. How dare you, God, put me here? The angry, or the anger of the damned will know no bounds. Now, as I said, I sure don't want to end up in hell. But one thing I know for sure, that if I do, if I've deceived myself all these years, and if I'm one who says, well, Lord, Lord, didn't I do this and didn't I do that? And he looks at me and said, please leave, I don't know you. And he sends me to hell. One thing I can promise you, that I'll be a weeper, not a gnasher. Because if I know anything about theology, I know that if he sent me to hell tonight, I could make no just complaint against him. I've been guilty of treason, cosmic treason. Every time I have sinned, I have asserted my will over the will of my creator. creator. I have declared that I am sovereign, not the Lord God. I've worked against his kingdom, not for it. I've sinned against a holy and infinitely righteous being who owes me nothing. And if I wake up in hell, I will realize I have only received what my life has merited. Not cruelty, not injustice, but perfect justice. I don't know about you, but sitting there listening, I listened to the full 15 minute clip of this and came across that part. And wanted to share that because it was sobering listening to it. And personally thinking, yeah, God owes me nothing. And thanking him for mercy and grace and for forgiveness that can only come through Jesus Christ. Through the faith in Jesus Christ. One other one I wanted to share with you. It's a little bit shorter clip. I came across a teaching that John MacArthur did about the truth about hell. Let's have a listen for just a moment. I think we sort of comfortably distance ourselves from that reality. Certainly in general, in the church, it is looked over, passed by, ignored. There are those who claim to be preachers who don't ever talk about hell, wouldn't talk about hell, avoid it at all costs, when the truth of the matter is it ought to be the first thing that we talk about when we talk about the gospel. This is about salvation from hell. The doctrine of hell, the truth of hell, the reality of hell has found its way into the thinking of our culture. According to the latest survey that I could find, seventy-five percent of people living in America believe in hell. They believe there's a hell. That's the influence of Christianity, seventy-five percent. Of those seventy-five percent, four percent believe there is any chance that they will ever go there. So we've gotten our point across. There is a hell, but we haven't gotten the point across that you're headed there already. That's the issue. Yes, my friend, hell is most definitely a real place. Hades, the temporary holding place right now where people go that do not know Christ, that have rejected Him, that have continued to rebel against Him and do not have, place their faith in Christ alone for salvation and for the penalty of their sins. 
are headed there and they are awaiting their eternal punishment when Jesus resurrects the dead and he judges them. J.I. Packer stated in his book, Knowing God, the character of God is the guarantee that all wrongs will be righted someday. When the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed, retribution will be exact and no problems of cosmic unfairness will remain to haunt us. God is the judge, so justice will be done. There's a quote from Thomas Watson, who was a Puritan, and I really love this quote. And it's something that's encouraging for all of us who are true believers in Christ, who are truly born again. Thomas Watson said, whatever trouble in this life a child of God meets with, it is all the hell he will ever have. And I hope that that encourages you to hear that. The reality of hell that should be driven home is why hell exists. The message is not why you do not want to go to hell or why you need to avoid hell. The message also is not being Satan's playground, which is unfounded in scripture, as I've stated. The real message is the gospel. And hell is vital to discuss because it is the just punishment for sin. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news to our bad news. You see, it is what we need to hear. And the gospel, as I've said before in last week's podcast, in last week's episode, the gospel is not just for unbelievers, as many of us have been led to believe, that it's a one and done thing and we don't need to continue to hear the gospel anymore. But the gospel is for believers as well. We need to hear the gospel every day to be reminded from what we have been saved and that our trust and hope and faith and, and our strength is in Christ. That's who we're leaning upon and trusting in, who our faith and all of our hope is in. We need to hear the gospel daily and be reminded of it daily. M and maybe we need to have a refresher on what the gospel is. The key to understanding the gospel is to know that it is good news. It's good news to the bad news. And that the Old Testament law was given to Israel during the time of Moses. The law is a measuring stick. And sin is anything that falls short of perfect according to that standard because God is perfect. And the righteous requirement of the law is so stringent that no human being could possibly follow it perfectly in letter or in spirit. Despite our goodness or our badness that we perceive as those, we are all in the same spiritual boat. We have all sinned. Romans 3.23 tells us all have sinned and all have fallen short of the, of the glory of God. And the punishment for that sin is death, which is separation from God. And in order for us to spend eternity with God, sin must be removed or it must be paid for. In order for God to be just, a just judge, sin must be punished. And there's only one of two ways that that can be done. It's either through accepting what Christ did on the cross for us, or it's in re rebelling against that rejecting Christ and what he did, the full atonement for our sins on the cross and the punishment coming upon us, the wrath of God coming upon us. The law established the fact that cleansing from sin can only happen through the blood sacrifice of an innocent life. Hebrews 9.22 tells us this, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The gospel is the death of Christ on the cross as the sin offering to fulfill the law's righteous requirement. We see this in Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. We see in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 10, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. 
We know that under the law that the animal sacrifices were offered year after year as a reminder of sin. They did not take away sin. They reminded the people year after year that they were sinners and that they were in need of atonement. And it was also a foreshadowing, a type and shadow that was pointing to the coming of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ. When Christ offered himself at Calvary, that symbol became a reality for all who would believe. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 18 tell us, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. What Jesus did was complete. It was finished. The atonement was finished on the cross at that point, and that is good news for us. It's good news. The gospel is not only the death and the burial of Jesus, but it's also the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. This is in Romans chapter 4 verse 25. The fact that Jesus conquered sin and death is good news. The fact that he offers to share that victory with us is the greatest news that we could ever ask for. So we can simply see in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 6, that the gospel was presented to us for understanding. It says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. This is a core passage in understanding the good news of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul received this gospel and passed it on. This means that he received it. We know that Paul received it from God. This is a divine message. This is not some sort of man-made teaching. When we receive Christ, it's by faith, by grace through faith in Christ alone. Salvation is the gift of God. We see this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. The gospel is the good news that God loves the world enough to give his only son to die for our sin. The gospel is good news because our salvation and eternal life and home in heaven are guaranteed through Christ. The gospel is good news when we understand that we do not and cannot earn our salvation. It is a work of God. The work of redemption and justification is complete. It's finished on the cross. And Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. According to 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, we were once enemies of God. Those of us who are born again, we were once enemies. We were once children of wrath. But now we have been reconciled by the blood of Christ. And we have been adopted into the family of God. And this is God's great love for us. The Father's great love for us that's been poured out on us to be called children of God. And it's good news. There's no condemnation. Romans 8, 1 says, there, are there, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no other way to the Father. There is no other way to eternal life but by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone for the atonement for our sins. John three seventeen through 18 says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, uh, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So this is the good news to the bad news that's in this world, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And those that do not receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they rebel and they reject and they, they curse God and they do not want anything to do and they, with God and they do not believe that they need a Savior. They will spend an eternity away from God. And that place, that eternal judgment for body and soul will take place. And that person will be cast into the lake of fire after they have been resurrected and they have been in the temporary abode of Hades. 
that's still a place of torment and punishment. And it will not end. Hell is a real place. You don't need someone to have a trip to hell or an alleged trip to hell to tell you that it is real. You have the word of God and you have the testimony of Jesus Christ to tell you that this is a real place. And the only way that you do not spend eternity there is through faith in Jesus Christ alone for the salvation and redemption from your sins to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and to be reconciled back to God. This is a ministry of reconciliation. This is not bad news. No matter who wants to say it is by saying there is no other way to the Father but through Jesus Christ. This is good news because without Christ, there is no way. There is no way to God. There is no way to eternal life. There is only the second death. I wanted to share this today to maybe shed some light on this, to give some food for thought, as always, for some considerations, to go back to Scripture and to understand that Scripture is sufficient for you to understand these things. And to test these things of what you're hearing. And to understand that this isn't something that you just need to hear about hell to scare you enough to where you just walk an aisle or pray a prayer and then it's a done deal. To be in Christ is to receive him as Lord and Savior. To recognize what he did on your part. To recognize God is a just God. We are all on our way to hell without Christ. But with Christ, when we are in Christ... And we are born again and transformed and the Holy Spirit comes to abide in us and to dwell within us. And we are no longer children of wrath, but children of God. Then we have hope no matter what we face in this earth, no matter how difficult it is. We have that eternal hope to look to because of Christ. And my friend, I would encourage you to put your trust in Christ alone. And I would encourage you to not put your trust in in potential vain imaginations of man and potential delusions of man or woman that are saying such things. But scripture is enough for you to understand the reason why hell exists and why all of us need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Be blessed today by the truth of God's word. Thank you for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and on Instagram at lovesickscribe. And if you enjoy reading, feel free to hop on over to lovesickscribe.com and subscribe to my blog. I've enjoyed being with you today, and I look forward to our next time together as we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and we continue to grow together in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.